Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's online office hour, bursting Apache Spark workloads to the cloud on remote data. My name is Amelia, and I will be your moderator. Before I introduce you to our speaker, I have a couple of housekeeping items. All participants are automatically on mute throughout the session. We will be using Slack to communicate, so please take a moment to join us on the community Slack channel, which is copied into the chat box. It's aluxio.io backslash Slack. However, if you're having trouble joining Slack, feel free to message me your questions instead, and I will share it with the group. In today's session, our presenter will be giving a presentation followed by a demo. We will have a Q&A session at the end so we can answer all of your questions. To ask a question, a reminder to join the community Slack channel posted into the chat box. But if you have any trouble joining Slack, you can also send me your questions instead through the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen under the tab questions. And finally, please don't hesitate to send me your questions anytime throughout the presentation. There's no need to wait till the end. Lastly, today's session is being recorded and will be available for on-demand playback. We will email you the link to the presentation as well. That's it on the housekeeping items, so let's meet our speaker. I'm very pleased to welcome Bin Fan. Bin is the founding engineer and VP of open source at Alexio. Uh, prior to Alexio, he worked for Google to build the next generation storage infrastructure. Bin received his PhD in computer science from CMU on the design and implementation of distributed systems. Without further ado, please welcome Bin. Thank you, Amelia. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bin. I'm happy to be here to present how uh, our experience and uh, our in the past few years how we build Aluxio to enable users burst their uh, workloads, especially Apache, work, Apache Spark or an, another uh, some other analytics workloads into hybrid cloud in on remote data. So uh, as Amelia just mentioned today, so during my presentation, in case you have any questions, uh, please just reach out to Amelia or post it on our Slack channel and our uh, Alexio experts will be curating on the Slack channel to help you answer these questions. And in the end, we will also have a Q&A session. So yeah, so feel free to ask questions anytime. Okay, so uh, in the beginning of this talk, I want to go over a little bit the big data journey in the past and to motivate this talk. So about like 10 to 15 years ago, if you talk about the big data or analytics stack, people are mostly talking about a co-located, deep, deeply coupled compute and storage uh, architecture represented by the Hadoop architecture. So in that architecture, people typically run the no different nodes, but with mixed workloads of storage like HDFS or compute like MapReduce or Hive workloads on the same cluster. So in this way, uh, the architecture is basically closely modeled after the Google GFS and also MapReduce paper to represent a very unique and a very um, scalable way to, to provide uh, scalable workloads. So later on, people realize um, having the compute and storage deeply coupled may not be the best solution, especially you have different dimensions, you have a different rates to grow your compute and your storage. So in this way, you have to, in, in a deeply coupled way, you have to buy both storage and compute uh, to grow your cluster, to scale your cluster horizontally. However, from time to time, you may see different speeds. Uh, you may have just more data to grow every year, or you have just more compute intensive workloads to grow every year. So you probably want to have a disaggregated uh, architecture, so you have different storage. Uh, you have a separated and disaggregated storage from your compute. So that's what we see in the past few years, a lot of uh, in the data center, in a lot of data warehouse, people are building architecture like this. They have a separate compute cluster from their uh, dedicated storage or main data lake. And on top of that, in the past few, in the recent years, we see more different trends to build this more efficiently. For example, one way to build this is to have uh, HDFS, burst HDFS in the cloud, public cloud or private cloud, meaning you have a, uh, you have a, you have a compute resource 
in available in the public cloud or in your private cloud, which is not co-located, which is not close to your main storage. And only when you want to run some store of compute on your storage, you want to enable the compute. That means you have to burst the data in some way to the compute where you're running your jobs. We're also seeing more and more cases people want to support analytics across different data centers because you may want to grow your business in different regions and you have a uh, your, your historical data in one data center and you may want to access that data for certain computation in a new uh, set, set up data center. So we see these cases also a lot. So essentially, this goes to my next slide. We see the challenge in the past few years is uh, we see data is getting more and more remote from compute from time to time. And this creates a lot of challenges, especially you have data-driven initiatives and you have a lot of compute to add because you want to do machine learning, you want to do analytics, you want to be more data-driven. But the data is stored more on your previous remote, the on-premise Hadoop storage, or you're growing your cloud storage, and which is also remote uh, if it's in AWS or in some other private cloud. So the challenge here is how we can make the remote data look more local and use the remote data more like local data to the compute without having a lot of um, heavy lifting including manually running jobs to migrate data from one place to another or running some complicated ETL pipelines to prepare data for a compute, which can be time consuming and also error prone. So if we have a solution like this, this provides a tremendous amount of business values, including you can make your data immediately available for um, much faster data insights. And also you can enjoy the benefits of having more elastic computation power in the cloud. So you don't have to, you, you, you can just like, for example, uh, right away initialize a uh, hundred different instances in AWS in a, in a few minutes without waiting, uh, without waiting for the data to be available and your compute, to be, uh, compute resource to be available. So in that way, you can respond to markets, you can respond to your mission much, much faster. And because you, if you can make the data more local, you don't have to pay the egress costs, which we see from time to time, this can take 80%, I can cut 80% more egress costs if you have a solution like this. Okay, so um, one way we are solving, we're seeing a lot of people are using Aluxio is really to solve this zero copy bursting problem. And they put Aluxio in a stack closer to the compute and connect Aluxio to a, a relatively remote data source like a AWS, if it's, everything is in AWS, that's S3, or in the case on the right-hand side, uh, you can connect Aluxio to a data source on-premise. In this case, data is more remote. In, any, in both the stack, essentially, the data, is, the data can be cached and orchestrated by the Aluxio layer and look like really local data to your Spark workloads. So what is Aluxio if this is the first time you uh, hear about Aluxio? It's an open source data orchestration layer. It's a sitting between the computation and the storage. So Aluxio provides the most common APIs, including a Java file system API, the HDFS API, S3 API, and even POSIX API for mostly uh, 20 machine learning workloads. And also, also Aluxio provides different adapters to different uh, storage, including the including S3 or HDFS or, uh, for example, object stores like a Mini or a Ceph. And in this way, Alux you can use Aluxio as a transparent and the interaction layer in the in the middle to be the data abstraction layer without understanding or even knowing what is the data storage you are really using, how far it is. So in this way. Uh, the data developers or data consumers can be con can be focused really on how developing the logic using the data without uh, getting down to the details of the, a lot of different uh, data related details. So let's see if you have a Spark, what uh, what is the if you put the data in Alexa memory, 
and the and if the alloxin memory is co-located with Spark, the speed is likely to be or the throughput is likely to be on the order uh, ten thousand or even uh, hundred thousand megabytes per second on per node basis. So this is once the data is really local and it's in memory, the speed can be really really fast. And if the data is on the local disk, so the bandwidth is lower, and but you can still achieve the moderate uh, to the thousand to ten thousand megabytes per second if you put data in the Alexio by using SSD or hard disk to manage the data. But if your data is really really remote, um, this is on the remote HDFS on-premise data data warehouse. You only trigger the I/O when it is necessary, and this bandwidth can be as low as like 10, sec, uh, 10 megabytes or uh, maybe 100 megabytes per second. In this way, you can see the bandwidth difference, right? If you have a lot of data closer to the compute in a more expensive but more performed storage medium, then you get much, much higher performance rather than leaning on uh, using the very limited bandwidth talking to your uh, data data source in a remote data warehouse or remote data source uh, when uh, all the time. But you also having this data cached in a Lux layer, so you can also reduce the traffic you needed to retrieve the data. So Alexio originally was, uh, this is a little bit history about Alexio. Originally, this was a research project called Taikyang, and it was co-developed by the uh, then by then PhD student Haoyan Li, who is the Alexio CTO right now in UC Berkeley M Lab around 2013. And in 2015, we open sourced this project and created this company to commercialize Alexio. Uh, this is company is founded, backed by the top VCs, including Andreessen Horowitz and others. So along the way, we have a different a set of different uh, industry uh, um, recognition appreciation. So right now, this is a very fast growing open source community. We have more than a thousand contributors on GitHub and more than four, actually 4,500 GitHub stars today. And this project is under Apache 2 license, just similar to a lot of other projects in the uh, big data analytics, analytics space. And we have our community Slack channel. Uh, more than a thousand users are uh, on the Slack channel, and you are welcome to ask questions um, during this presentation and even after this presentation, and to engage with experts and maintainers for this open source project. And as I mentioned, this is open source and hosted on GitHub, so you're welcome to contribute to the source code. What are the key innovations about Luxio? How we enable, uh, why we can burst the data with zero copy? Well, there are a few. There are a few things. One is we uh, provide data locality with intelligent multi-tier and data caching. So the data, we can identify which data is more frequently used, more hot, hotter than the other parts. So we can identify the working set in case you have a large data set to work on, but each time you only need a small piece of this working set, then you, get, you can get a good data locality from having the small piece of data set into the local memory. And also you ha have this data accessibility using the popular APIs and data API translation provided by Alexio. So different applications, different data frameworks can assume Alexio as the same data abstraction, although they are using different clients, different APIs. Uh, and also elasticity. We provide indirection. You can mount different data sources uh, from HDFS and S3 into the same uh, Alexio metadata service. So let's go to the features one by one. The one is that they improve the data locality with intelligent multi-tiering. Uh, so in this way, Alexio is really a layer between sitting between the Alexio applications including the this computation frameworks and also the storage. So in this way, we can manage the storage resource allocated to Alexio, including RAM, SSD, hard disk, and telling which data is more frequently used and cache the data into this memory or SSD or hard disk, whatever the storage you're using, uh, without repeatedly going to the backend storage. So in this way, 
we can provide a much better data locality. You can access our applications can access data in Luxus space much faster, and also we can have data. We can enforce data policies to evict data from uh, the slow tier and according to data temperature. We can bring in more data, new data, and evicting the old stale data to make sure that data in the Luxus space is hotter and is what you need for your application based on data access pattern. So this is basically, you can think of this as a distributed caching layer on top of data source you're, you're connecting to um, with ability to use different memory storage, different storage media. Another thing is the API translation by providing different APIs. Uh, an analytics frameworks like Spark or Presto, they, may, they may prefer using HTF as API, but for uh, for example, Kafka, Cafe or TensorFlow, they may prefer to use uh, POSIX API, like the Fuse, Fuse interface, to inter with, interact with the same data abstraction backed by uh, Alexio. And underneath, you can use different storage. Uh, we will provide adapters like S3 drivers, HDFS drivers, and FS drivers to be able to talk to different data sources. Um, yeah, this is the this is the data uni, uni, unified namespace. This is the Alexio metadata story uh, metadata service. You can mount different storage into the same Alexio namespace, so it appears as a one logical uh, namespace file system tree to the applications. As I mentioned, uh, you can for example you can mount S3 buckets into Alexio as a logical directory called data and also mount another HDFS cluster into a Luxio logical namespace as a root. In this way, users can just talk into the, uh, can just talk to this application, uh, this logical Luxio file system tree uh, with impression it's a single file system tree and it's also very unique to the, uh, it's a combination with, with the data combined from different data sources. Uh, yeah, so, Further down, if you just mount a Luxio file system as a service to using the uh, using the Fuse API as a service to your own laptop or your your server, um, a Luxio service which is remote and can be distributed will just show as a local folder on your local machine. And this is typically the way we see a lot of machine learning users are interacting with Alexio because these machine learning workloads they typically they they, they like to use with a different uh, with different applications in the local data. So I want to share you a few examples. Uh, the first one includes a hedge fund which is the leading hedge fund in Wall Street uh, managing many billions of data for the investors. So what the application is to run the Spark workloads in the public clouds for machine learning jobs, but they will have regulation or had concerns, so they want to keep the data on-premise in their HDFS cluster. The way they're doing this, they just want to uh, push this compute into cloud when necessary. For example, when Fed cuts the rates, you want to recompute all your model based on the new rates, right? Um, so in this way, you don't want to wait for all your computing resources to be available in your own data warehouse. But to finish this as soon as possible in public cloud is the, perhaps the best uh, is the best candidate to achieve this elasticity. The problem is the data gra gravity, right? You have all your data on your on-premise data warehouse. Even you can have some dedicated bandwidth between your data warehouse and public cloud. This still can be slow, or uh, it can be during peak time can be quite slow and and um, very inefficient to move data uh, repeatedly to these public clouds. So instead, you can deploy Alexio as a data orchestration layer closer to Spark in public cloud, and based on the data, which is much closer to the compute, uh, you can deploy a cluster Spark workloads much much faster and finish job much faster. So essentially, they report much faster time to insights using this new architecture, I think that they reported like 10 to 40 times faster end to end to train their models for this particular user. Uh, this is another 
use case we found uh, using Spark with a relatively remote data is stored in the Teradata warehouse, Teradata. And this problem is the Spark is remote from their Teradata data warehouse. And during the peak time, especially when Spark crashed, during the peak time, it's so hard or sometimes impossible for them to re re-establish the compute. You have to wait for hours to be able to recompute data because they have to wait for the data transferred from data, the Teradata warehouse to the Spark cluster. So in this way, they put Aluxio in the middle, closer to Spark, and they will first uh, put the data into Aluxio from the data warehouse and then run Spark on top of the Aluxio data. In this way, even the Spark jobs crashed were uh, stopped for some reasons. It's much easier and much faster to just to reinitialize the job. And they see the much faster time to uh, to market. And as a quote by them, now we don't have to work Sundays. Uh, this is the another use case we uh, we found. This is uh, shared by the engineers in Walmart. Uh, this is not the Spark workloads, but it's very similar. It's the Presto Analytics workloads running in GCP in Google Cloud. Uh, the data warehouse they're running, they have multiple different data warehouses across the across the world and running Hadoop clusters. So they want to enable the workloads to run Presto, but on top of data from different data warehouses. And if you just do this naively, by waiting for the data transforming from uh, transferred from one data warehouse into this uh, GCP computation cluster, this can be very slow and there's no SLA this team can provide to their users. Instead, they deploy Aluxio as a layer in between the Presto workloads and their Hadoop clusters, and they achieve much, much better uh, performance, query performance latency, and they can provide a much better performance guarantee and also this lowers their cost without creating data copies from their uh, Hadoop-like cluster to this uh, GCP cluster and reduce the egress cost by a lot. Um, aside from these two, uh, three use cases I'm sharing, there are a lot more enterprises that are moving to this independent computer storage or remote computer storage, leveraging Aluxio as the one, of, one way to uh, migrate data. To, as a data abstraction layer, hiding the latency. So you can see a lot of names across different industries in this slide. In the end, Aluxio is an open source community and we have a lot of momentum. So these are the uh, takeaways you can quickly get from uh, our open source community. And this, is the, this concludes my talk and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Ben. We already have a couple of great questions here, but before I get started, a quick reminder, you're welcome to join our community Slack channel at aluxio.io backslash Slack and post your questions directly into the general channel, or you can ping me your questions on GoToWebinar instead, and I'm happy to share it with the group. Great, so let's look at our first question here. Uh, can I use Aluxio for other jobs in addition to Spark? For example, machine learning jobs. Oh yeah, so definitely. So actually, we are working closely with a lot of users to enable their machine learning workloads. Especially, we see uh, people running machine learning workloads more and more, or mostly in the Kubernetes environment, where you don't have a, naturally you don't have a local storage or closer to the applications. So you have to move data around. Um, a lot of users in this case they found it's useful to having Aluxio there here to hide latency uh, and especially with the latest development in the gpu gpu cards and they are they can be very io intensive they can consume data very quickly very fast very very very, very high throughput so having this aluxo layer in the between machine learning and especially gpu machines and data storage can be very helpful Great. Our next question here is, how many files or objects can Aluxio handle, and do I always have to use memory? Uh, uh, that's a great question. So Aluxio, as I mentioned in this talk, Aluxio builds a 
a logical file system using its own metadata service. And this metadata service is designed to handle a lot of a lot of different uh, a lot of different individual files and um, objects. So especially if you enable the off heap storage, this is uh, when you enable the off heap storage, we can at least handle a billion small files and objects. Great. And we have our next question here. Uh, oh, what sorry. is the difference? Sorry. I think pardon. I think I there is another uh, the second part, which is uh, is do I always need to use memory, right? From the oh yes, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, you don't need to always use memory. Uh, in the, in the original, uh, when Alexia was still a research project, um, so the, at that time, people I think a lot of people using Alexia only for memory in memory computation like Spark. Uh, but in later later on, we basically develop the features to support multi tiering So you don't have to always use memory, but instead you can use SSD or hard disk or a combination. Actually, when the, once once your data is remote enough, for example, you're reading data across different data centers, I would recommend you not use memory, but leave the memory resource to your computation or your compute uh, your, your machine learning workloads or analytics work uh, frameworks, but using Alexis to manage SSD or hard disk, which can be beneficial already, uh, sufficiently beneficial enough. Okay, great. Perfect. And our next question here is, what is the difference between Alexio Redis and Memcached? Oh, uh, Alexio is basically a data oxygen layer between an analytics workloads, machine learning workloads, and uh, storage, like a, a file system storage, including HDFS or object stores like uh, S3 or Ceph. Uh, for Redis or Memcached, they are uh, at least uh, they were famous for they are famous for serving as a in-memory key value store, and they are serving different workloads. Uh, typically, Alexio is designed to serve uh, file systems with uh, sometimes like a hundreds of terabytes or even petabytes of data. Uh, but Luxio uh, for Memcached or Redis, they're mostly, um, to my knowledge, they are mostly serving more fine-grained data workloads, uh, serving key value stores, and the key value store is relatively small. Uh, each key value pair is mostly uh, most more popularly like a, on a few hundred mega, uh, kilobytes on that granularity. So it's a very different workload. And then a follow-up question here is, how does Alexio compare with IMGD, uh, in parentheses, example, Hazelcast? Oh, okay. So I'm not, exp I, I'm not very familiar with Hazelcast, but Alexio, I think Alexio itself is a very uh, unique in the ecosystem that it's providing a HDFS-like interface. It's providing service to the HDFS-like workloads. And versus the Hazelcast, I don't think they're they're designed for workloads like this. So essentially, Alexio is specially designed to scale horizontally to handle, as I mentioned, billions on the order of the billions of files, and each file can be it's a, can be very large on the order of like a terabytes or even more. So that's basically the space Alexio is working. Great. Uh, our next question is, uh, does Alexio provide support, or what kind of support does Alexio provide? Uh, so Alexio, we have a company called Alexio too, right? The Alexio company is also providing a enterprise edition on top of the uh, community edition with enhancement in security, with the enhancement in enterprise-ready features, uh, so uh, like a, more data policies like this. So for the enterprise edition, we do provide uh, the enterprise level support. With the community, we are mostly using uh, GitHub issues as the dashboard and also actively using the Slack channel to talk to, to, to engage with users 
and we see a lot of users, uh, community users, are very active on, uh, on GitHub and also on Slack. Great. Uh, those are the questions I have for now. Uh, folks, you're welcome, to, again, to post them into the Slack channel, into the general channel, or you're welcome to uh, message me your questions, and I'll bring it up. As we hang around for a few more questions, Ben, is there anything else you wanted to um, expand on? Yeah. So we are releasing Alexio 2.20, I believe, today or uh, or maybe yesterday already. So this is a new release we are, uh, we are, we are providing, and it has a lot of enhancements in the integration with uh, – it has a few great features. One is the closer integration with the Presto. And uh, so we have the project called Stru Alexio Structured Data with the Alexio Structured Data Service. It can provide more data abstraction in addition to the file system, logical file system, but also a, a logical, uh, like you can think of table system. Uh, we provide the data abstraction on top of tables. So the analytics frameworks like Presto can benefit from a closer integration by knowing, understanding more about the data. So we're, we're working actively on this project and hopefully to provide much more benefits uh, to analytics workloads. And we uh, in, also in the two point in the two point two release, we are adding a new layer, uh, which is the Alexio embedded client side cache. Once you put Alexio clients in your applications like Spark or Presto, you can uh, turn on certain features. You can turn on certain flags, so you can use Alexio clients to manage a local cache. Thinking this, this way, you have distributed applications. Alexio as a service is a separate, independent, and can be sometimes remote uh, distributed cache for your application. But enabling uh, but enabling this local cache into this Alexio applications like Spark or Presto, this can be viewed as L1 cache inside these distributed applications. So they don't have to go to RPCs to retrieve data, but just go into their its own application, manage data, and it's transparent to the application on data on the cache hit, it goes to the local cache, which is L1 cache. Um, if it's cache miss, it goes to the Alexio service. So that's the interesting paradigm we're seeing, and a lot of uh, we 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 start to see a lot of good benefits, performance benefits these li local libraries providing. And uh, we're actually also planning for the next release for 2.3. If you have any suggestions or feature requests. Uh, you are welcome to provide us either through our Slack channel or go to our GitHub to create an issue. Oh, thanks for the sneak peek. Uh, we have another question here. Does Alexio support multi-cloud? Oh, yes. Actually, Alexio provides the functionality to, uh, as I mentioned, Alexio is a logical file system, has its own metadata service, file system metadata service to provide a logical file system view to the applications. So you can definitely mount different public clouds or different cloud storage into the same logical file system. Uh, a typical thing I did like for demo is to show mount a S3 bucket and also mount a GCP bucket into the same Alexio namespace. And you can query data uh, from this logical file system namespace without understanding, oh, this part of data is from GCP, this part of data is from AWS S3. Uh, this is totally transparent to users and providing a lot of benefits and uh, convenience to the users. Uh, here we have our next question. Does Alexio support all files like Parquet, ORC, etc.? Yeah, so if we're talking about the Alexio file system, uh, the answer is yes. Alexio file system is agnostic to file formats for file types. So all files are basically transparent. They're just by streams to Alexio file stream, uh, to Alexio file system. 
doesn't matter if it's a parquet or this is the uh, ORC files, but they just allow like to present this stream of bytes to the applications uh, with like caching and metadata, metadata management, this kind of things. Uh, but if you talk, when we are talking about the Alexio table, that's the new experimental feature we're adding. Uh, this is more we are providing actually support to. I think we are providing support to Parquet files and Parquet and ORC files for now. Yeah, because that requires some, to some degree the understanding of the semantics of the different files, so we can represent this table and store the table of metadata information in the table system. Great, and welcome to keep the questions coming. We have a couple more minutes. Uh, in the meantime, I did want to mention our next office hour is taking place on March 24th. It's on the topic of optimizing query performance by decoupling Presto and Hive data warehouse. Uh, this is going to be jointly presented by Jean Pang and, of course, Bin. I'm going to post the link into our chat box in case folks are interested in also attending. Yeah, so I'm always on Slack channel. If you have any questions, if you have any uh, if, if you are not sure whether Aluxio is to fit, feel free to reach me out on Slack channel. I'm happy to uh, to discuss, to understand your use case and to provide my suggestion. And also, uh, we have a lot of use cases around, uh, as I mentioned, like today, the uh, hybrid cloud, but also we see a lot of users using Aluxio to, for example, just to build a data abstraction layer so their product can be more portable. Uh, they can run the same thing on different storage without changing the application, without changing the code. Uh, there are just like a have, there are different benefits having an indirection. So I see more questions coming. Yes. Yeah, so our first question here is: Does Alexia also support data catalog or databases? SQL, NoSQL. Uh, this is a good question. So this is this is related to the the table or the structured data service where I just mentioned. Um, actually, um, in case in case I was not clear previously, a Luxo data service is not meant to be another NoSQL or another database. Instead, it works it works as a more like a, a federation or abstraction layer on top of this to provide uh, data analytics, especially big data analytics frameworks, a better way to interact with data. So you can think it's a uh, just similar, very similar to file system. The logical file system Alexio is Alexio file system is providing this Alexio data stru structured data service is on top of different, uh, for example, the uh, Hive data warehouse, or I think we're working on on top of like a, some a glue, um, this kind of metadata service. So it has many, it has the knowledge about tables stored in different. Uh, in different other systems, but aggregating them together and storing them together and providing a more convenient way to uh, analytics and enabling a lot of optimizations to analytics. So right now, the first uh, analytics framework we're targeting is uh, Presto, and uh, does, but it doesn't it doesn't prevent us to extend the similar um, experiment to Spark or some other frameworks, and within this what we call Alexio structured data service. Uh, we provide a catalog service. It's basically a table namespace, a DB or table namespace. And you can list the tables, you can list the database, and you can access the column, column and level information um, from this catalog service. But more importantly, this enables transformation, which is a service running in Alexio, inside Alexio to for example, to aggregate files, consolidated files, small files into bigger ones, or to transform from a unfriendly format to a more friendly format to applications. Uh, with this, not this is only possible with knowledge like this. So I won't say, just go back. I, I just to say, restate this. I don't say I don't 
view Alluxio struct data as another uh, DB or another uh, NoSQL. It's, uh, it's just like a keeping more knowledge about what data is stored in different database or in di different data warehouse uh, as a table structure and enabling data transformation so applications, analytics applications can consume data more friendly. And the March 24th uh, online office hour will also dive deeper into this topic of structured data management. Uh, our next question here is, is there a path to multi-region support? And how do you handle updates from one region showing the changes in another? Ah, so yes, there's a, uh, when you see multi-region multi support, so we, Alexio as a system, definitely supports mounting different storage in uh, from different regions into the same logical names into the same logical file system space yeah so if you change but independent from that if you change the data in one region and there are certain pol uh, policies you can employ in Luxio to pick up the change it can be time based it can be uh, it can be on demand or it can be lazy the different policies you can pick so if you change the data in one region, so in a Luxio space, this data can be eventually, uh, or uh, it depends on the policy, it can show up, uh, or you can run command to manually sync data between the UFS, the data source, what we call UFS in a Luxio terminology, uh, to sync data from UFS and the Luxio namespace. Uh, so this is basically the data syncing between a Luxio and data change in one region. I'm not sure uh, if I answered the question, but it seems like you're talking about having the data change propagated to one region to another region. Uh, that's not really the topology Aluxio is, is, is supposed to work with. So I, I may need some more clarification on this when you see multiple different regions. Okay, I see uh, propagated data. Um, so you, if you have data, um, okay. So there, there are different, there are different ways to propagate data. For example, there are you, you, you mount a, you mount two different. There are, there is a way if you, you can mount two different regions, storage from two different regions into the same logical path in Alexio at the same time. And you may want to migrate data from one storage to another storage according to certain policies you set, for example, based on data age or based on data temperature. So this is the policy I mentioned, a uh, policy engine I mentioned in the enterprise edition where we're working. So you can use the enterprise edition to set policies like this. Oh, I'm writing the data to this logical path, but this logical path is based by two different data storage in two different regions. If the data is earlier, it's younger than certain, uh, younger than certain age, I put it in one storage. Once the data is older than certain age, I will migrate the data to another, the third story, the second storage, which can be cheaper but colder. Yeah, so that's definitely possible. Uh, I saw the question like, uh, will it bypass the end of storage? So um, it's yeah, I I I don't I don't fully understand the question by uh, bypassing the end of storage there. The data is supposed to persist into under storage. Maybe so. Yeah, maybe Frankie, we can we can keep this on the uh, on the Slack channel. I will just go back to Slack channel to answer your question, which might be more efficient. All right, in the meantime, we have time for one more question. And this question uh, is from our GoToWebinar listeners here, is how is Alexio compared with uh, Databricks' Delta Lake? 
Uh, that's just a great question. So uh, Aluxio certainly shares some, like a, I would say some, there's a, some commonality between Aluxio and Delta Lake. They are both providing to some degree some abstraction. Um, but my understanding is Delta Lake is more focused on the providing um, the Spark workloads and also providing uh, optimizations to certain metadata operations to 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 files to parquet files to ORC files. So uh, so you can achieve certain things. For example, to have a unified uh, streaming application and batch applications. For Aluxio, the focus is very different from Delta Lake. Um, Aluxio is focusing on how to speed up the data retrieval by reducing the unnecessary I/O across applications and the uh, the, the backend storage. And on the metadata side, Aluxio is focusing more on scaling the scaling the, the amount of data you can handle, how to scale this uh, horizontally, and also we're providing different interfaces in addition to just the Hadoop interface, but more to, uh, for example, S3 APIs and the POSIX APIs. So machine learning workloads can also benefit from Alexio. So uh, I would say it's uh, it's like in a high level, people can be confused or people, it's, it's, uh, it's not a surprise people see the commonality, but if you go down to the details, they're trying to solve different problems. Great, and I spoke too soon. We have one last question here related to the geographical distribution of data. Is it possible to have a single HDFS data source geographically distributed to multiple Alexio instances? Uh, I'm a little bit confused about the question. If we are talking about having a single HDFS, but there are multiple different single HDF data source graphically distributed to multiple. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand this question fully. Um, yeah, I may need more clarification because HDF, you can definitely mount a single HDFS data source to multiple different Alexio deployments and they are in different places and we see people are using in that way. Uh, so that's no problem if that, if, if if that is what you are asking, the answer is yes, yes, you can mount a single HDFS multiple times to multiple different Alexio instances. But if you need, if this is not what I understand, feel free to go to Slack channel. I saw Amelia post this question on Slack and we can iterate on Slack. Okay, great. So yeah, the, the uh, attendee responded that that's the question. So we've come to our time today. With that said, we had some really great questions and discussions, and we more than encourage folks to join the community Slack channel and continue discussions there. You can also always reach out to Ben, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next office hour on March 24th. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amelia.